Hello, and welcome to the Dad and Sons Podcast. How are you guys doing this week? You guys doing all right? Liam is distracted. Uh, George is George. I'm not. I'm here. I'm trying to, I'm processing whether or not to answer that question honestly. I'll just be like, yeah, bro's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is a choice every week, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, it is. how real do we get? It's like, how much do we share? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, we all get it. Like, it's just how much, because everyone deals with their, their stuff off of like, you know. We have lives, do we? Do we exist out of this audio bubble? We definitely do. The Discord knows. They do. <sighs> Unfortunately. I got something for you guys. All right. Ooh. A weird George story that's a little creepy, a little strange. It's not like d- depressing, horrible, I hate life stuff. More like, <laughs> what kind of weird people do I live with? Um, yeah, I want to tell the story about the creepy elevator man. The creepy elevator man. Oh my God. It is October, George, please. The creepy elevator man was an encounter I had with me and Eddie about a week ago when I was taking him out one time to walk. And according to the uh, resident rules and bylaws of the building I live in, you are technically supposed to pick up and carry your dog when you ride the elevator, which I believe I've talked about on the podcast before. But truth be told, you know, just between you and me and all the listeners of the podcast that I'm putting out on the internet for thousands of other people, sometimes when it's in the middle of the night and there's no one around... I'll let him walk around on the floor on the elevator. So so shoot me. <gasps> I'm adding some music. <laughs> <laughs> so one time in the middle of the night when no one was around, I picked him up and uh, was carrying him to the elevator. Well, bleh, I hadn't yet picked him up and carried him to the elevator. I opened up the elevator door and there was a uh, creepy man standing inside. And then I bent over and picked my dog up and then walked into the elevator. And I just want to lay a disclaimer out at first and say that creepiness is not necessarily like one's demographic or appearance. Creepiness is a state of mind. Creepiness is what this man proceeded to do afterwards. He said, oh, that's a real, real cute dog you got there. And I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, everyone loves him. And then this man says, wearing all black, mind you, like tall, balding white man wearing all black says, Did you hear about the thing that happened a few years ago where another resident had his dog get trapped in the elevator doors and it died? And Oh, my God. What the fuck? And I didn't really know how to respond to that. (laughs) So I just kind of looked at him and said, okay. I don't know if he realized what he said was as creepy as it is because suddenly he started to stammer a bit and then said, that's the building rules, the house rules. And then he shrugged and got off at his floor and... He left it at that. He said, that's the rules. I think the rule he was referring to was how you're supposed to pick up and carry your dog, lest it get trapped in the doors and die or something. I I thought it was so that they don't jump on other people or pee on the the walls of the building. But um, (laughs) no, according to Creepy Elevator Man, it's so your dog doesn't get trapped in the elevator doors and die. Oh, my God. Wow. What the fuck, dude? How is that acceptable public behavior? I what? Like that's the first thing he thinks about. Like he's like, oh yeah, that's that's the reason why you have to pick up your dog and bring him inside. He didn't even say that. He like saw me pick him up once there were you know like Metal Gear Solid guards that could exclamation flash at me, uh, letting my dog walk on his own four feet in the elevator. But um. Like, there was this unspoken assumption that it was about picking up and carrying the dog, and that made it worse. Hmm. You know when uh, someone likes you and they tend to say the worst stuff? Maybe, you know, maybe he was just interested. George? Maybe he was just interested? Yeah, yeah. You think, like, a couple hours over drinks and soon he'd tell me about how the vaccine is secretly a microchip (laughs) that Bill Gates is using (laughs) to depopulate the world of conservatives or something? To genocide the white people or whatever. Oh my god. Oh yeah, genocide the white people. <laughs> yeah, oh. I mean he was a tall white guy wearing all black who was obsessed with with death. That's what we're gonna kill off. We're gonna kill the, the majority of the US. <laughs> That's the conspiracy theory <laughs> that my aunt believes. Well, black people are running the world now? Yeah, right. 
minorities are running the world now? We both know you are secretly running the world now. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> oh, there'll be lots of changes, let me tell soon you. Soon enough. Soon enough. Wait, is that the like real life talk that we were just talking about before I went down the <laughs> creepy elevator man story? Possibly. Who knows? But yeah, that's a guy who uh, lives with me. Um, how about you guys? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hopefully not on your floor, right? Like maybe like one below it. Maybe he lives like right under you. Thankfully, he did not get on the elevator with me. The elevator doors opened up and he was just there. Did he get off before you or did he hold the door for you? Did he give Eddie a pat? He got off on a different floor than me. He did not give Eddie a pat. He did not hold the door for me. So he was already on the elevator. You went down. He got off on a different floor than you. So before the lobby? Yeah, yeah. I got out on the huh. So he knows someone in the building. Or he had to break into a different apartment to find a disguise <laughs> he needed to enter into the off-access area in the separate wing of the building. Slip into someone else's skin. <laughs> yeah, he definitely was giving me Agent 47 vibes. Interesting. Oh, man. You see a barcode when he walks out the elevator. Ever since then, Eddie has been so restless. He is just always, always begging to play. He can sense creepy guys. He yeah. wants to meet him again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, well, I play two games, okay? <gasps> I'm going to talk about the first one because I want to talk about the second one later on when it, whenever you guys are done. When we finish with Metroid Week. Yeah. Um, so the first one. Two really good games, all right? Ooh. Yeah. I played Unsighted. I didn't even know it was a Metrovania until it was a Metrovania. Oh, I was reading about that today. It starts off like, okay. Jeez, it really is Metroid week on the podcast this week. Yeah. It starts off okay. And it is about robots that became sentient because of a meteor that crashed and wanted that power too and wanted to use it for themselves. And these were, the planet was already ruined, so they are already in space. It was just like this deep lore about this. And it's actually quite nice. It all starts with like upscaling images of boobs. And then before you know it, the, the robots are taking over. <laughs> <laughs> All because we wanted to see our waifus in, in cleaner, high-resolution format. It's basically only women robots. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> well, no, there's a couple of men, but, like, it's mostly uh, women, which says a lot about this, this society. It's like, oh, we're just going to make robots, but they're all going to be women. <laughs> it says a lot about <laughs> the society I would make. Or the men all died because they're useless. Or something like that. And so the whole world is hot, sexy robot babes. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're not. They're drawn okay. They're drawn in all different ways, which is nice. I was glad for none of the weird shit. And so the whole world is robot girls with great personalities. But this game, it just gets really good. Like, because the power-ups you get are just perfect. It makes the game infinitely better. Every... Every time there's a power up, it is fun to play. That's cool. It's been a while since I played a game like that. Like, it's just like, holy shit, like the ice grenade. All of a sudden you can, like, everything has purpose and everything can be upgraded and everything can, you can, there's blueprints where you can make weapons. It's well done. I would say the story is just like, okay, but like all video game stories are just okay. Aw. But the gameplay and... It's basically like Zelda, but I would say it's Zelda inspired and not a Zelda clone. You know, you collect these crystals, these five crystals, and you get through. I would recommend there's going to be a easy mode called Explorer, a recommended mode, which is like like the medium one. Yeah. And then it's gonna be like a hard one. I would recommend if you do not want to rush through the game, you gotta go through Explorer. It is a little bit easier, yes. But there's a time limit because something that happens where the robots are running out of energy. Another meteor. <laughs> no, the humans tried to take the, the meteor and you're running out of energy and everyone has a certain amount of hours left. And you can see that every time you go do anything in the world and every time you talk to any robot, the number's going to tick down. 
So the more you explore, the more you get stuff, the less they have to live and they might die <laughs> during your travels. Whoa. Damn. You can choose to give them energy through like this dust, these rare dust things that you can find. But you also use that dust to get more syringes, which is basically more uh, flasks, you know, like Dark Souls. Mm. Yeah. It's well done. The game is well done. If you want to feel heartbroken, I played it on both, but I ended up beating it on the Explorer mode because I wanted to 100% complete it and I got to 99.49%. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus no. Christ, Matt. That is the most I have played a game. And it's, and the pacing is so fucking well done. It's like only six hours to do that. To get to 99%. Damn. Yeah. Game Pass, baby. Game Pass. Oh, it's on Game Pass. Okay, okay. It's on Game Pass. You know, if the art's a little weird, but, you know, if you like a Metroidvania that feels really good, I would say probably played on mouse and keyboard, which is weird to say, because controller is already broken, so you were forced to, but it does feel good on mouse and keyboard. Mm. Broke my A button. I need to get another mm -hmm. uh, keycap. <laughs> Broke my A button uh, <laughs> playing this game, but yeah. Oh no, you have gamer keys, your WSAD. Yeah, I do. And I need to find the, the extra ones that I do. I, I like the textured ones that came with the, the HyperX thing. You ever uh, go, go over to a girl's house and you see that her WSAD keys are more worn down than the others and that's how you know she's a keeper? <laughs> <laughs> Thing. Dude, my WSAD keys totally have the paint a lot more scraped off than all the others. It can't just be me. That's literally Jess Hunt. That's like every game uses those keys. Yeah, it's it's funny how like comfortable like Wazda is or Wazd. And it's also funny seeing uh these like Conan O'Brien clueless gamer segments where he's like, oh yeah, W for four words. It, it doesn't seem like it would naturally fit, but it kind of does. Anyway, sorry for the tangential derailing. No, no. Um, what about you guys? We're all playing Metroid. Yeah, playing Metroid. Both of you guys played Metroid? Yeah. I'm playing the fake Metroid. Yeah, George is, of course, not playing the real Metroid. Wait, he's not playing Dread? No, he's not. I'm not playing the, the Metroid fan game that got taken down this week either. Uh, that There was a fan-made remake or D-Make, I guess, of um, the Prime games called Prime 2D that Nintendo took down. Last year, Nintendo took down another Metroid 2 remake, which is the one I played this week. Apparently, it's still there. Haven't we already talked about this before? I thought you played this before. Did I? I'm pretty sure you played this before and we talked about it. I don't remember playing this before. Huh. Like, I downloaded it last year and kept a file of it on my hard drive this whole time. But it was specifically the uh, the 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 news and the talking over Metroid Dread that had me like dig it up, dust it off, and actually load it up and play a few hours. And it's good. It's really good. It's good because it wasn't sixty dollars, right? <laughs> Can't complain for 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 that. Uh, AM Two R is a fan made Metroid Two remake based on a black and white Game Boy game. That was the first of the Metroid series is, but um, this release is more in line with the like 1632-bit GBA style game, more in the vein of the Metroid Fusions. It has a like super duper solid feel to it in terms of running and shooting. Like it feels less slippery than than the actual Super Metroid did on the, the 1994 SNES remake at SNES release. And you also have edge grabs like in Fusion. There is a like in-game flavor text and, and hint system like in Fusion. It kind of sort of feels like if Metroid 2 was was done in the vein of, of Fusion. And um, it's solid. Like the level designs all branch out in memorable ways that are smooth enough to traverse. It doesn't have a whole lot of annoyingly frustrating segments in the bits that I was playing. One thing that it does seem to be lacking, though, compared to like 
what does feel like a real official Nintendo Metroid experience is the spooky atmosphere. There's something ambiguous and hard to describe that is missing. You know, the soul. It feels like there's a lot of reused and recycled assets from the real games, which I'm sure there is, but it feels like, like egregiously so. Like the whole picture feels like it's kind of lacking detail. It has this dull brownish look to it that's not visually... I mean, it, it looks fine, but it, it doesn't look as, as visually meaty as... It's not a Nintendo production. Is what you're saying. Yes, yes. It's fine for a fan game. Or, or great for a fan game. It is one of the better fan games I think I may have ever played. Definitely. But still, still fan game. Mm. Well, I was going to say, I thought you were playing Dread because... That's what I've been doing. We would have all been playing Dread. Ah, so we've both been playing Dread. That's yeah. the secret game you've been playing. Oh, yeah, me too. Okay. I did not know it came out until yesterday. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. I got to grab me one of those things. Yeah. Um. Wow. Uh, Liam, you take it away. Um. I don't know how far you are because, I mean. I'm a few hours in. Like, I am, let's say I just got to the, the fourth island. Let's call them islands. Islands? <laughs> mm, I don't know if I'm that far. I just got the stealth cloaks. I got, like, the stealth cloak stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're a little ways back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I started playing last night, and I just, I couldn't stop. It is I could good. not stop. It It's good. I mean, it's, like, slightly, like, a horror game. Like, I mean. Yeah. It feels good to move Oh, and oh shit. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, like, that's entirely the best part of the game, is the movement. Yeah. Holy shit. The controls are tight. Yeah, it's tight. And then when those those fuckers are chasing you, it, it feels good to run away. <laughs> like, it, it, and any game th that you can slide in is a win. <laughs> I gotta say. Liam, it gets scarier, just to let you know. Does it really? Yeah. Because I find the Emmys to be just fucking annoying, to be honest. Really? Because they don't really do anything uh, that affects you. Like, even if you get caught, it takes you back, like, to the door of the room, right? Pretty much. And they're not mm. really that scary. And what uh, frustrates me about them is that they're in these big zones. So it's not spoilers, but the way the Emmys work, supposedly, well, the game markets itself is that you're being stalked, right? You're being, you know, yeah. stalked by these things. You're not. They're in a very specific zone that <laughs> that is like, well, I can either go in the zone or I could just go around the zone. Of course, you have to go in it, you know, to make progress. But you know when you're going to go in it, so you know when to expect them. It doesn't feel like you're being stalked. You just know when to expect them. Uh, the game goes all sepia tone, and then you get like, every time you move, it makes like a little sound bubble. So you know they're around you. Um, so there's definitely no feeling of being stalked. And then when you <laughs> run into them, you have to start running really fast, which means you're not really paying attention to the map and you're just running. So you're not digesting things like you would in a Metroid game. You know, The whole idea is to memorize the map and learn how to backtrack. But this is asking you to run really fast and ignore your surroundings and just get safe, which kind of is like the opposite of what Metroid usually should do. They're easily the, like the weakest part for me. It was fun. A friend was asking me like, oh, you know, does it have the classic Metroid music? No, it doesn't. Does it have a memorable map? No, it doesn't. Does it, does it feel like that classic Metroid? Not really. But why do you like it? I don't really know how to explain it. It's still a good game. <laughs> it still is a great game. I actually like the whole Emmy stuff. Really? I'm surprised. Yeah. Because like it, it always feels like I'm always like just this close to getting caught. Always. Okay, okay. Have you been caught a few times? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. But like nothing really happens, right? Yeah, because some of them get ridiculous. Okay. Because nothing really happens though, right? You just have to do it again. Even with the you bosses. Just have to do it again, like yeah. it just takes you basically outside the door and you just try again. There's not really yeah. any failure state, which is fine, but it does take away from the the tension or the and you know, the the seriousness of the situation. And like not knowing the map, like you're just like clamoring and running as fast as you can with it, it like trying to get away from it. 
And for some reason, most of the time, you kind of always find the area you're supposed to go into. Usually, you kind of yeah, yeah. You you don't purposely look for it. You just kind of you just kind of keep going, and then you stumble across it. I think that's kind of hard to do, though. They have to they have to design the layout that way, you know. And I feel like it, you know, there's a little credit to to Nintendo to actually doing that properly. And some of the ways, like for instance, like when you slide through some of those doors, it automatically locks behind it, mm-hmm. like. Oh, maybe you haven't gotten to that part yet. Okay, yeah. Like, things change a bit. But, like, they're not all the same either. The Emmys change. And... Ooh. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. Like, I would say the least enjoyable part is how you kill them. Oh, the Omega the Omega kind of thing. You basically get it when you've cleared it and the game's like, well, there's no need to come back here. Boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what 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 you feed furry children to? The Omega Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, those those things are creepy, man. The, I love the way they're animated. It's so slick. Like when they are facing you one way and you slide underneath them, and then they contort their body and face the other way, and you're like, oh, oh. and they move way faster than you expect them to, right? Like you think from video game characters, if you run pretty fast and they're off the screen, they kind of like disappear, but no. No. Enemies will keep chasing you up until the zone runs out and you're safe and then it's like a normal video game because they can't, for some reason, get past a door. <laughs> that makes me laugh. Yeah, it's very, it's very video gamey. It's super video gamey. I don't yeah. know how you feel about the map, but I feel like the map is the biggest letdown for me. Like it just visually is kind of boring and bland for the most part. I don't like that it's split up. Mm. Like the way it's split up. Like you you go back and forth a lot between the maps and they do make it easier for you to do that. But I feel like it's so much, so much to to explore and so much to get through. And they do try to steer you in the right direction. But in at the end of the day, it's just like, holy shit, this is a lot to go through. I feel like, yeah, I would say the map for me it's kind of like in an okay region. Yeah. It's still f- good. Like, I still feel like it's designed well. It's just not like, it could be better. It could be better. I think the game also is visually, like, kind of stunning, right? But at the yeah. same time, kind of boring. <laughs> like, yeah. Samus looks and moves amazing. The animation is, like, sick. What do you think about that first boss fight? Come on, you gotta like that first boss fight. The one where you're fighting the the creature with the whip tail that turns invisible. Yeah, the one that gives you the cloak. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was video gamey. <laughs> really? Maybe because you're designing stuff now, you're you notice it more. Your tastes have changed. I don't know, like because like obviously with the tail, you can see the weak point, right? Like it's very right, glaring. Right. But with the head, you can't see anything. It just looks like another part of the body until you you have to fire directly on the skull. Even if you like graze it at yeah. the top, the character doesn't flash. Has but it kind like, of look, it doesn't like feel mouth. satisfying when you hit it in its head because it just feels like you're hitting any part of its body. There's no like satisfaction to it. And also the tail move that like when it traps you in the corner on the like third part of the boss fight, when you have to climb onto the spider magnet, for some reason it has like a tail whip move that can just hit you and you can't jump out of the way of it which kind of confused me so no no you could jump away of everything when you're climbing on the spider thing you can jump over it only if you've got the double jump but i don't have that yet no no i jumped over it i I haven't gotten hit by that one because like you can like it's the movement i had to die like three times to kind of get understand like what it's doing like the tail how it whips a certain way is how you can avoid it and sliding under it and then hitting it in his head. Like, this does a lot of cool shit. So the whip is low. Like, there's, the, like, the fast whip that yeah. goes low. But then, And then there's the overarching one that goes into, like, right. a U. You move forward into that space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're on the spider thing and then it does that thing against the wall, when, yeah. you, when it releases it and brings it back... You can't jump off the spider magnet and like avoid it. It just hits you anyway, which I felt was really weird because you can't go down. I jumped over it. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Because I tried like, I tried at least 10 times and I couldn't get it. I would, every time it would trap Mm. me in the corner with the acid, it would do like the U tail thing. And then as it was going to lift up the back to neutral, I would jump to avoid it. 
And it would just like, even if I was super high, it would just like slap me every time and I'd take damage. Oh, you're not talking about when it smashes into the wall. You're talking about when it just does this. No, I'm talking when it does like right close to the wall. It does the U. Every time it does the U, you have to go in it and shoot its face. But that's weird because on the third form, it has like the acid on the floor. So you can't go on the floor. And then it does the U. It felt a bit weirdly telegraphed at times. It's not exactly a hard boss, but you know, it's kind of just one of those that you just like, all right, show me what you got. All right, I died. All right, next time. All right, show me, <laughs> show me what you got. Died. All right, next time. And then you go in and you beat it because you just avoid everything. Man, we got to play games together. We all got to play mm. games together. Because uh, I, I think that's one of those things where like, it'll be much easier just to show. Yeah, 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 for sure. Because like, if, you're, if you have somebody else on the couch... And they're like, they'll be able to see it. Because sometimes you're just like, you're zoned in. You're like, you're just playing something. And then somebody on the couch be like, oh, no, no, you could just like jump over. Because you're in your mind, you're probably thinking that there's acid on the floor or whatever like that. Like, yeah, that's the beauty of couch co-op. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I kind of miss those days. Avoid it. Jump, 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 jump. I'm not an end. I know, jump, I know, right? Dickhead. The backseat gaming, right? <laughs> yeah. Shut up, man. I'm trying to fucking do it. <laughs> it's like, give me the control. I know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a good Metroid. Like, I played Samus Returns. So I played Mercury Steam's first Samus game, you know, first Metroid mm-hmm. game, the one on 3DS. And it was great. It was a it was a good game. It was a nice surprise. But I do think Dread is better. And it, it mm-hmm. looks lovely in the Switch in, in portable mode. Uh, it's lovely. Yeah. And then on uh, PC... I shouldn't even say this, but you can play on like 4K. <laughs> oh, you mean the Kotaku article that's totally telling you to fucking steal shit? <laughs> they got in trouble yeah. real bad. Oh, fuck that. They got in real trouble, man. Let me tell you. I was like, looking at videos and I was like, damn. Because like, I remember trying to play um, Fire Emblem before I bought it. Like, just to see like how it was. And this shit was glitchy as hell. But Metroid? It should look like it's as clean as hell. It is. It runs sweet as. It's lovely. Runs sweet. For some reason, I just want Nintendo just to have a home console again. I don't know if I want to play on my Switch. <laughs> um, I really just want it. I want 1080p. I want to pay 1080p. And now we're back. I know. No, I, I like the Switch. I was hoping that the Pro was coming out and not this OLED shit. Because I want 1080p, man. I've seen the OLED. In person, it is beautiful, though. I must admit. Yeah. OLED is real good. Only by if you play portable all the time. If you play on the TV, yeah. don't even bother. But my oh, God. Yeah. In portable, woof, woof, it is a difference. It is. It's like going from like a 32-inch TV to like a 50-inch and above. Like, it is like that kind of upgrade. You know, you're still watching a TV. Picture still might be great. But the size and the crispness, oh, it's good. For people who have OLED TVs, I envy you. Those things are beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Judge Dread. It's a good game. It is. I feel kind of bad that I've had like the classic Metroid overworld theme kind of sort of juggling through my head for the past few days. And, and you guys have, have not. Yeah, I don't remember the music, which is bad. That's one of the downsides is the music is not good. It's very flat, unfortunately. I actually played most of it in mute. Yeah, like all I remember is that music when you first start, like from a save point, and it goes, like some type of superhero music. What is that? It's so weird. I was just like, is this Smash Brothers? It seems like it's like they're going to announce her as a character. Judge Judy. Judge. (laughs) Objects into Smash. Yeah. Judge Dread, rather. I was just thinking of famous judges. This is the first Metroid I'm going to beat. I know, right? This is terrible. I try to play Super, and it's old as fuck. Um, <laughs> it's good, though. <laughs> it's old as fuck. Let me tell you. It just feels a little slippery. And I usually don't say that, but holy shit. I'm not with you 100%, but yeah, 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 my friend who was yeah. asking me why I like Dread, even though it didn't have all the classic things, and like I was complaining a little bit about like the music and the map are not very good, blah, blah, blah. He said, what would you play then? What what would you rather play, Super Metroid or Dread right now? And I'm like, yeah, I'd rather play Dread. <laughs> yes. It's, oof. it's a bit rough. I would rather play Dread right now. Yeah. Oh, man. 
that's some hard for me to to adjust to because when I was growing up, Super Metroid was regarded as like an untouchable, like Ocarina of Time. It is, but Ocarina of Time, same thing, right? Would I rather play Breath of the Wild or, or Ocarina of Time right now? Well, I'd rather play Breath of the Wild. So now that we're not growing up anymore, like what is the current consensus? What's everyone's favorite Metroids? I'm not allowed to even be in this conversation. <laughs> I mean, Super is the best 2D, even though Fusion is fantastic too. But I think Prime is still my favorite, personally. Yeah, the, I think my primary, like, tastiest part of a Metroid game is the spooky atmosphere. And Prime is the one where where it seems like they got that nailed. But I still have, like, bad memories of the backtracking getting worse. I don't know. Super Metroid has, like, a big place in my heart. I really like that it gets cinematic and scripted towards the end. Backtracking is tough in 3D. I think one thing that Prime suffers from a little bit is backtracking in, in 3D is is always worse than backtracking in 2D. That's just it's just the way it is. I don't know if Metroid Zero Mission gets enough love, though. It's been, like, forever since I've played it, but I remember, like... Because it's not as good as Fusion, that's why. Uh, okay, I guess. It's been, <laughs> it's been too long. There's probably too many of these games to have, like, a consensus of uh, what should be... Uh, universally agreed upon fan favorite. Is there? Is there even? It's universally agreed upon. It's not Metroid of the Rem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that the one thing everyone can agree on when it comes to Metroid? I think that's the one thing everyone can agree on. Is it really that bad? I should try to play that. It's like entirely just average. <laughs> Damn. Ninja Theory, right? Was it Ninja Theory? Team Ninja? Team Ninja. Yeah. Not can be fused with Devil May Cry friends. <laughs> I feel like there's not being talked about with Metroid Prime 2, though, because that one, I believe, kind of sort of review better, get a little bit more polish and praise than Prime 1, but I don't think you or I have played a lot. Yeah, Echoes is great, but I remember a lot more about Prime 1 because at the time, Prime was like, the shit. It was like, oh my God, how have they done it? How have they made a Metro game in 3D that actually is fucking amazing? It's the first game that got crazy with, like, visor HUD effects. It's fucking brilliant. And how you can see your own reflection and the, the water that wipes off. That's pretty common, like, nowadays. But back in 2003, that shit was mind-blowing. Like, like, wow, the HUD is part of a teleological game universe machine. Cool. Like, can you imagine? Do you remember, you know, like, you think back to, like, getting games now. But, like, 2009, the Wii, Metroid Prime Trilogy, you got all three Prime games in one box for the Wii. That is, like, glorious. Amazing package. I remember playing it on my Wii U. I remember playing it on the Wii U, too, when they announced that on the, that it'd be coming to the virtual console. Like, damn, I ain't played Prime in ages. It was only, like, four years or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like it back then, and that's, uh, like, one of the few releases that they put on the um, virtual console for actual Wii games going only one generation back. Nice and positive about Metroid. I like I like to see it. Better than the the not positivity that was going around about Metroid yesterday. Oh what was what was that? The the piracy Kotaku article. Oh yeah. What was not positive about it? Because they were directing readers to the emulation ROM website. Oh, really? And apparently Switch emulation is like already doing okay. That reminds me of, of the days back in the, the GBA and then the Wii when uh, Dolphin was, was fully equipped and ready to go when new Wii games were coming out the very same weeks. It seems like Nintendo consoles skip a couple generations before the emulators are caught up with like real releases that doesn't happen too often they linked the actual website not Holy only did they say shit. that they had an, a, a sentence that was like if you don't feel like paying 60 dollars for the new metro dread then you can just play it in 4k on your beefy that's the one i know of yeah they had to update the article and delete that of yeah. course of course. Yeah, because you have to dump the BIOS from your launch model switches, and those are the only ones where you can apparently legally do that or something. No, no, no. All right, let me get it straight. Whatever you think about piracy and emulation and Nintendo earning money, I don't. That's fine. That's your opinion. But a professional industry website advocating stealing a video game is fucking not on. It's like not on. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't. Fucking do it. It's madness. 
it's career suicide to start with if you want to review any video game from that company ever again. So good luck to whoever wrote the article. But a professional industry outlet. He's definitely fired. Professional industry outlet saying, you should totally just, if you don't fancy paying $60 for a product. Oh, I, I want a McDonald's so- breakfast, but I'll just walk into McDonald's and take that breakfast because fuck McDonald's, they have loads of money. They, they had to approve it, right? Yes, an editor would have to approve it. And that makes me wonder, like, what's going on with Kotaku these days? Because a, a couple months ago, when the Epic versus Apple lawsuit was going on, they had a lot of really great coverage of that. A couple months earlier, they were kind of shuffling around their editorial review boards and were posting a bunch of kind of, like, sophomoric, edgy stuff that seems more in line with this. So they've, like, zigzagged back to bad Kotaku after having a few weeks of good Kotaku. And now I'm just disappointed in the whole world and myself and all that jazz all over again. And just to clarify, because I know people get a little weird, not to say that the guy or girl should get fired. It's just that usually companies ask for their head. I've seen it before. Well, it's not even that. It's it's use your common sense. You write professionally for an industry website. Yeah. Something that is a part of, well, would like to frame itself as professional part of the games industry. And you're advocating for stealing another part of the industry's work. It's like, I imagine if Kotaku had subscriptions that and they were making videos that were only for subscribers, and then some subscribers were sharing those videos to people who didn't pay, Kotaku would be fucking losing their shit, right? It's stealing. Like, I get Nintendo's problem with emulators. We've had this discussion. But that game came out two days ago, and you're literally writing in an article that if you don't fancy paying $60 for this game, you should fucking steal it. Fuck off. And not only that, that you can play it in 4K and 60 FPS even smoother (laughs) on your PC. Here, download the link now. Well, that's probably a better experience than the real thing. (laughs) Yeah, at that point, it doesn't even matter about the money. It's like, I want to play in 4K 60. Fuck the little 720p. Shit, I'm up here playing these 720p fucking images, and I'm like, man, it must look good in 4K. I mean, one of the best games on the Nintendo 64 is Perfect Dark, and the Nintendo 64 can barely handle that game whatsoever. But if you play it in an emulator, it's fucking fantastic, and there's definitely something to be said of how playing a game on a PC at a higher spec than the original console can yield a better user experience for the guy in the seat and the controls. Oh, absolutely. I play all my Game Boy Advance games on my PC. Yeah, so if you're playing 20-year-old Game Boy Advance games, I doubt it's as big uh, an object of contention over something that came out like two days ago. Yeah. I think that's right. I think, you know, we know about Nintendo and emulation, right? Whatever the feelings are on that and, you know, preservation of video game history. But my God, thinking it's okay to just fucking steal a, like a $60 video game two days after it came out and write an article like that is just like, are you are you insane? <laughs> like, are you mad? Yeah, it it is bad. Just what the fuck are you doing? You know, you know those websites that say like shady stuff all the time. They don't really get exclusive interviews. You know, the ones that you never could name. Yeah, Super Bunny Hop. <laughs> oh, Who's that? No. I heard there was a guy who once went by the name Super Bunny Hop. And now I just know a George. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking up his LinkedIn and he's written for Kill Screen and Gizmodo and Medium. Cool. So he should know better. And this does not read like someone who has that kind of experience. Well, even then, right? You think back to whoever the editor at Kotaku who let it go forward is. It's like, ah, come on. Like, you just bring heat up on yourselves. Come on. Yeah. Kotaku's not bad, but my God, sometimes. Don't help themselves. Feel like they have carte blanche to just do what they want. It's like, that's not how this works. I had hopes that that maybe public opinion on Kotaku might turn around after their coverage of the the epic suit, the Blizzard, but then that that just got thrown in the toilet all over again. <laughs> it's so weird to read some of the comments and people like justifying it. And- that is weird to me. I get it, and like everybody who tweeted at me, like, look, I get it, right? You you're not going to be swayed either way. And George obviously sits a little bit in your camp. 
Nintendo have a lot of money. But that's not how this works. Just because it's a game doesn't give you any right to play it just if you don't want to pay for it. Just the same as everything else doesn't give you any right to like go walk into a restaurant and eat their food for free just because you assume you owe or owed it because you that is a part of your culture or whatever, right? Just because that company has a lot of money. I get it. We all have problems with capitalism. But the fact is, this game isn't even really made by Nintendo. It's made by a Spanish team called Mercury Steam who have a team who need to be paid, right? And are probably going to get bonuses depending on how many it sells. And of course, we do know piracy doesn't really have any correlation on it. But there are after effects of the way companies treat certain games based on performance and also based on public opinion. And if like Nintendo, we know, kind of have a shady mindset about these kind of things, or like, well, actually, no one really buys more than a million copies of Metroid, and most people seem to just want to pirate it, and oh, we're not going to make another. It's weird to me to think you could justify, because it's a video game and Nintendo has a lot of money, you think it is okay for you to steal it. I mean, when you crunch the numbers, there's definitely certain degrees of severity to stealing from the poor versus stealing from the rich. But this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a product made by a company for you to purchase. I, I like, I get it, but it, it's still not, especially coming in the it, from Kotaku, right? It is not okay. Yeah. No matter how you justify it, you are basically saying it is okay to steal this just because it's a video game. Anybody who says it, who then goes into their job and works in a job where they sell things, would be flabbergasted if people just walked into their store and was like, I'm gonna take that because I think I deserve that even though I don't want to pay for it. Like, it's one rule for one and zero for the other. It doesn't make any sense to me. What if they're not selling the thing at all? What if the thing is out of print or unavailable? Yeah, we're, we're talking about a game that came out two days ago. No, yes, no, yes. We're not going to go down this road. But when it comes to 20-year-old <laughs> GBA games, I doubt anyone is really going to care. No, I'm going to play those fucking things on emulator because I, I like those little, uh, those little shaders. Man, those shaders are great. It looks like a painting. When it comes to, to using shaders and unlocking the frame rate in the N64 version of Perfect Dark and, and using mouse and keyboard controls with that game, I doubt the karmic balance of the universe is going to have you going to hell after your death if you pirate a 20-year-old GBA game or, or Perfect Dark. This is coming from a master pirate. Like, I've been pirating for years, right? And it usually shows and stuff like that. I have every subscription. From Apple TV, thanks to fucking Liam, to Netflix and Hulu and maybe not Hulu because I don't really watch stuff on Hulu. But um, HBO Max and stuff like that. I watch because it's convenience. I want to do some type of support for all the stuff that I've stolen. And, you know, like if Nintendo had a subscription service that was that had all these games, I would happily pay for it because convenience over anything is is the best. Me trying to find these Game Boy Advance games physical versions and pay for it at some mom and pop for $60. Fuck <laughs> that. But yeah, yeah. And that's that's for old stuff. That's for old stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can talk about emulation like game preservation, but this is a is a very very different conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then judge but judge dread definitely Judge uh, dread. Great yeah, game. Yeah. If you want to play it on PC, definitely you know, pirate least, you know, buy the game and then pirate the game. <laughs> I think there's, I think that that's how it works, right? You buy the game and then you can pirate. And then it. you play in 4K. And then the you play it in 4K. You, yeah, just, yeah. you put your Switch cartridge in the USB port of your computer and it, it works. Like one of the reasons why that statement they originally published was factually inaccurate is that the only legal way you can actually emulate Switch games is with a original model that has since gone out of production. Like, it's only 1% possible in the first place to do it legally at all. So, like, you can't even really bend the rules with this case. You guys been uh, playing anything else? No. Why no. would you play anything else? When I can play Metroid on my Switch, Metroid on my PC, why would I do anything else? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I did watch the last episode of Ted Lasso. Yeah, I'm glad I knew where it was going and it did go that way. I was like, thank God, because the, le the next season should be much better. <laughs> what an asshole. Huh? What, an, 
What an asshole. I know, right? What a fucking dick, man. Shit. The little man complex shit, man. It's just, oh, God. Ted Lasso is brilliant, as we've mentioned like six times on this podcast. Yeah, now. it's, a, it's it, a good show. It. <laughs> because it, it it gets me angry, you know, and shows don't do that. So I'm like, oh, this is a good show. Yeah, okay. And then I move on with my life. But Ted Lasso, that shit stays, man. That shit's in my brain. I, I know Ooh. the characters, you know, like it's I'm brilliant. invested. You know, I get angry. So yeah. yeah. And and life is messy and it shows that. And I and I get that. People do things that you're like, oh, because you see it in a oh, show, God, and when hey. you have to see it, you're just like, ah. But, yeah. you know, people do this shit, you know? And I, it's, it's. How could he? It's, yeah. yeah, it's. um. What a great fucking show. It's a good show. It's a good show, man. They get real on that last one, man. There's a lot of good media at the moment. Yeah, man. Good shit's coming out. Thank God, man, because the beginning of the year was kind of trash. <laughs> <laughs> but we're coming in. We're coming in good. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully some uh, some more good games will come out i think so yeah the quote-unquote entirety of twitch got leaked on um last wednesday oh yeah the yeah, uh that the hacker says entirety but as the days have gone on there has been some back and forth regarding whether or not the leak includes passwords and credit card information Twitch is officially saying that it does not, that your passwords and credit card information should still be fine. There are some users on Twitter going through the data who have dug up stuff they do actually interpret to be encrypted passwords. I, for one, have changed my password, turned on two-factor authentication. Anyone who has money tied up into Switch who is hearing the news through this of all places should probably <laughs> go do that. But yeah, the hacker... Uh, uh, released this giant 128 gigabyte torrent on 4chan saying that the idea is to foster more disruption and competition in the online video streaming space because Twitch's community is a disgusting, toxic cesspool. That could be in reference to a whole laundry list of bullshit from Twitch. He releases it on 4chan? Yeah. yeah. He releases it on if 4chan and says that? On 4chan? <laughs> the irony. <laughs> if the idea is to protest Twitch not moderating racism and harassment and raiding and the, the monetization and fetishization of the whole hot tub streaming side of the site, then releasing it on 4chan is... Uh, they say they want to foster competition. So maybe the idea is is to get the tricks and the technology they use in, in the hold of some other websites who are going to try to start up a streaming service. But at the same time, all the social media websites have more or less like a, a similar baseline of features at this point that it's like about the primary demographics. Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit even all have live streaming features. It's just that Twitch is the one primarily marketed to gamers. I don't know if like a lack of venture capital that funds high technology is the problem either. If it is a protest move against uh, uh, Twitch fostering a disgusting, toxic, successful of a community. I got to admit, I did have a sneaky peek. You did? I did. I found a website. I think it went around the Discord. Did you find Matt's password? No, a website that collated all of the Twitch payouts so you could type in a streamer's yeah. name and find out how oh. much they got paid. Oh no, did you uh, find out how much I got paid? I tried to find between you and Matt and me and no information came up. So I think we're, we're just not in the top. We're not in any category no. in which it could ever matter. But I did find out some sneaky information from people that we do know. I'm not going to name any names, but I was surprised to know, oh, juicy little tidbits about how much those fellas are running. Barry? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh. I don't know. I would never say anything about a friend, but I was interested to see like some streamers who I watch who, like Maximilian, right? Yeah. Maximilian, incredibly wonderful guy, makes great videos. <laughs> 
definitely a bigger number than anyone here. <laughs> well, I, I, I was always surprised because, of course, Maximilian has been around for such a long time. But the fact that he now gets like 10,000 people watching every stream is massive. So Jesus. I was like, what? I wonder how big this guy really is. And uh, Twitch Payouts told me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, he's good. <laughs> he's, <Yeah>. he's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So creator payout reports from 2019 are included in that. I don't remember how much I was streaming in 2019. Apparently, Liam was more curious and, and looked it up, and apparently I'm not in there. Okay. All well, right. Maybe, I'm, I'm going to double check. Let's find out. But the insider technology stuff includes proprietary SDKs and internal AWS services, which gets into the territory of some weird middleware software not a lot of people know about that ends up forming the backbone of some corners of the internet, like CurseForge and IGDB. One other interesting facet, including the links, is that they were working on a Steam competitor with Amazon Game Studios that they are codenaming Vapor. No, not another one, please. They also have uh, internal IT security tools called red teaming tools, where they have staff pretend to be hackers. That did not seem to help them out in this case, though, unfortunately. Whoops. But yeah, uh, after after the leak went out, Twitch went on damage control. Can you believe Critical Role earned the most money? That's mad. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this seems about right. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty big. They got like all the celebrity backing and a big company. I know they're big, but... Dude, like you got to understand, like th that is a family. Critical Role is a family, a community. I would be surprised if they bring in more than like Ninja, though. Like I would expect either one of those to be like top three. Ninja's low. Really? Nin Ninja's Ninja used to be high, but man, that's how out of touch I am. After all the all the the N word bullshit, like all that bullshit. Yeah. He so Critical Role is number one right now. Yeah. Yeah. Critical Role is number one. Nice. I like that better than Ninja. <laughs> yeah. Fuck Ninja. Well, Ninja's not even up there. Ninja's, yeah. He's low. Ninja's really low down. Maximilian is higher. Yeah. XQC and shit like that. All those guys. The offline TV crew. But if, if someone in Critical Role says the N-word, they might not be in the next leak. Man, if they do, that would be like the image of Critical Role would be broken. For sure. No doubt. Even though there's just a whole a, a bunch of white people on that show, it would break everything because they're so wholesome. Yeah, I don't know how much you're willing to trust them, but Twitch is saying that at this time, we have no indication that login credentials have been exposed. They're saying the cause of the leak was due to an error in a Twitch server configuration change that was subsequently accessed by a malicious third party. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I would love to be in a room while these people like hack. Like, I want to see how that looks like. Like, how do you hack something? Is it like the movies? <laughs> <laughs> Is it like the movies? You just input a password. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just stuff shows up on a scary black screen. I was thinking the other day that, like, there seems to be a real cross-section of people who are brilliantly intelligent and also horrifically debilitatingly stupid. And hackers are, like, kind of <laughs> right where they both cross set. Specifically when it comes to the Titanfall 2 scheme, where the hacker was pretending to be the anti-hacker activist, but got found out because they, like, forgot to change their names in Discord. And, like... They had the knowledge of how to hack, but also had an extreme, like, lack of knowledge for how the professional business world would react and what they can do with their power. And, like, it reminds me of Jacques <laughs> Vallier. Like, like, you can be extremely brilliantly smart at one thing, but then debilitatingly stupid at the other to the point where it ruins your life. Yeah, I think the, the smart ones that are hackers are usually the ones that go work for the CIA and shit like that. Yeah. The ones that they... um pretend to be hackers on their their red teaming on the on the Twitch red team on their their IT department. My <laughs> god, these people are making so much money. It's depressing me scrolling down seeing how much money they're earning. <laughs> oh god, Why? I can't believe they get to pay for more surgeries than we do. It's depressing. People see this and they'll be like, "Oh, it's the same thing when I was talking about the NFT stuff. Like it's just like they see the money, like they chase after that dream, like there's plenty of ways to make money. You don't have to stream or this is like the what what the the point nine five percent. This is nothing. This is only the top 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 streamers that earn this much. There's like so many streamers. 
There's so many, but this they're making so much money. Yeah, I, I I wonder how many of like the smaller unknowns still got included in these leaks. I don't know if if Liam was like curious enough to plug in a, a like smaller random name into the. <laughs> no, I I like people. I was looking at uh, sitting around like 150k, which I guess is like a salary, which is fine. But the, like I'm scrolling down, I've been scrolling for like five pages now, and I'm still on like the six hundred thousand dollars a year. Whoa, kind of thing. Less money than I thought, but still a lot of money. Yeah, I I'm scrolling through, and they're all real big numbers. I don't. Did they only yeah. like get the one percenters? I think it's Twitch? the top ten thousand. Top ten thousand. Mm. So neither me or Matt are in the top ten thousand. No. <laughs> no. Those days are gone, my friend. I am an old, washed-up YouTuber, streamer. I'm trying to find one that I would be really surprised by. Like a speedrunner or something that would... I mean, most of the Smash players, like Hungrybox and like Mango, they're earning like 600000 a year. Jesus. Th- think about it, Liam. Would you rather be making games or would you rather be waking up and stream for 14 hours a day? And earning $600,000 a year, man? I don't know, man. I, don't, I really don't know. I'm kind of... Your whole life would be on TV. That's true. Your whole life would be on streaming. Like, that's all you would be doing. And there's still a lot of, like, drudgery and and repetitive grunt work that grinds on your soul after the years roll on. You have to enjoy that shit. That's true. That's true. And then you might not after the repetition and the burnout set in and then having to explain yourself to, to old people about what you do for a living and, and, and you know, making your, your dad ashamed. There's, a, there's all that that comes factoring in to... I'm interested to see because like I'm, I'm looking for like you know like I found kind of funny games right and of course they have a lot of people on staff right so I'm wondering how they split their salaries and like you know of course money comes from Patreon and donations as well as you know how much money they get paid out on adverts on Twitch and stuff versus you know one dude who then just reaps in like fucking three million a year I yeah. also wonder if um that payout number includes subscriptions and donations they're getting from users and not advertisers. Yeah, yeah, I think it's total I think it's total payout. Yeah, so it'll be your ads. So that would be ads plus the viewers surgery money. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> surgery money. It's crazy. Yeah. There are also some people who are low down who I thought would be higher, like Double Lift. Who's Double Lift? He's a famous League of Legends player. League of Legends have kind of gone downhill, right? Well, not really. Riot is still really high on according to this. I don't yeah. play League of Legends. I don't say the N word. <laughs> Man, this is so much toxicity on online. I wonder what online community doesn't have it. Oh wait, none of them exist. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like I was listening to a COD lobby. Uh, and it was just vile. Just like I was like, "Man, it still gets like this, huh?" Which card was it? It's a, the new one. The uh, what? What? What do they add? It's Cold War was last year. What is? Are they? Are they even doing one this year? Yeah, they are. Aren't they? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. I can't remember what it's called. Or I think it already came out already. Vanguard. Call Vanguard. Of Duty. <laughs> I, none of us knew. I've seen advertisements for this all over. Now that I see the name, it's all clicking. But that's right. This year's Call of Duty is Call of Duty Vanguard. I don't know anymore. How in the world did the like marketing presence that that brand has in our brain has fizzled away? It's like. They they all got cannibalized by Warzone. That's the one Call of Duty I I probably know and care about for for the past few years. And I'm yeah. I swear I've seen I've seen banner ads for Vanguard all over the place, but I could not tell you what it was until I Googled it just now. But yeah, um, uh, in in other other more positive news, IDOS Montreal is switching to a four day work week. Uh, I thought this would be a oh. fun uh, uh, Liam topic to uh, uh, mm. question him on on what he thinks about this. They are doing it in response to how they've kind of sort of already noticed since the pandemic that people working from home and doing pilot four-week programs in other regions have uh, already given them good results in terms of what sort of efficiency they would expect over a four-day work week over five. There were pilot programs testing this in Iceland, 
And uh, they say the results are conclusive. We are convinced that this renewed management of working time will help cultivate the creativity and motivation of the teams and become a real driver of innovation and performance. Um, remote working has transformed the way we collaborate. We had already started an important cultural transition with the implementation of a rest period, access to a personal financial advisor, access to a telemedicine program, and reimbursement of mental health care and physical activity costs. So yeah, Liam, what, what, you, you think a, a game can be made with a, a four-day work week schedule and still hit time and budget targets? I mean, this goes to show... I think, of course, I don't think a company would risk this without serious data to prove that it's the right thing to do. Whatever they're doing in terms of like actual project management must be fucking top tier, which is great. And kudos to them, kudos to Idos for doing it because arguably four days a week, you can stay focused and motivated for those four days a week. You know, your productivity is going to be high. They've obviously seen a trend that shows that maybe towards the end of the week or even the beginning of the week that, you know, people who don't have good enough rest or the inability to balance work and, you know, normal life is a bad thing. So I think it's a great thing. I reflect on like how my project would be approached if it was four days instead of five. And ultimately, I don't think that would work for us. Yeah. But I do think if you know with your next project that this is the schedule, then you're able to plan from the beginning for this kind of thing. You know, I think for bigger studio, it's easier because, you know, one month versus six months is kind of non, is not as important to them as it is maybe to small indie developers. But I think really a three day weekend or, a, you know, a three day versus four day week is arguably where we should all be heading professionally for the sustainability of the never ending on button that our lives are these days versus lives of the past, right? Like if you work in an office or you work in a professional capacity, at, let's say a digital agency and stuff like that, Slack and Discord and oh, email and stuff yeah. is never off and it's never it's never ending. It's 24-7. And yeah. if you're working remotely, you're dealing with people in different time zones. It is never ending. They say four-day work week, but they're probably still going to be responding to Slack over the weekend. Yeah, but that's the point. That's what I'm saying in terms yeah. of like actual, like I think mental stability for an entire generation of people now, especially in countries that move forward, let's say like Silicon Valley in America versus, you know, uh, Tokyo and Seoul and, and uh, major parts of China, right? Their lives are nonstop, constant, 24-7, right? And I think we're going to see a huge burnout of entire workforces eventually of our generation because we have grown up working five to six days a week, but, you know, there isn't any actual rest because you're either on social media all the time or you're, you know, you're connected to your phone and Slack is on there and Discord and your emails are never ending and you always feel some sort of responsibility to answer that. And I think that is going to have a really big adverse effect on a lot of people as we move forward. So I don't know. I think it's a great thing for them to do that. And hopefully, you know, they encourage staff to make sure that you carry on that way. Uh, one thing I'm interested in is um, do they pay the same? Does their pay change? Do they lose a day of pay? According to the official you know, idosmontreal.com slash news blog, they are saying they're not changing the salary for it. There you go. Goes to show that they're earning enough money to do it because like what in game studios, you earn the money you earn regardless of how many days people work, right? You're not selling stuff. To the Montreal and Sherbrooke studios will be closed on Fridays without changing the working conditions nor the salaries of employees. I've heard of companies doing a lot better by giving their employees an extra day off or paying them a decent salary compared <laughs> yeah, to the shit. Yeah, imagine that. I know, I know. Um, and everyone talks shit about that type of stuff, but uh, the big guys I'm talking about. Um, I remember this, uh, someone gave up their uh, million dollar salary and bumped up everyone up to like 60 to $70,000 a year. And now they make way more money than they ever had. And it's all because the CEO just makes the same as everybody else. It is insane to think about. So I'm, I wonder if it would, this would be like the same case of like, 
Imagine having three days off instead of just two. Imagine how mentally that would like really fix you. Like you'd spend Friday resting, you know, like you should. Saturday would be the day you get to do whatever you want. And yeah. Sunday, you know, you're getting ready instead of c- trying to cram everything on Saturday, not really having a rest. And on Sunday, panicking that you're already going back to work on Monday. Yeah. Not only that, who goes on weekend trips anymore, right? No one. Imagine like packing your bags on a Thursday night to go off, like if you were living in the UK, you go off to Amsterdam or something, you know, go on Thursday night, quick flight over, you're on there Friday, all day, Friday, all day, Saturday, come back on Sunday morning, bang, back in work on Monday. Oh, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I was in Amsterdam. I had a great time. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it seems insignificant, really. I mean, to a lot of people, it's going to be like, oh my God, you, you know, over the course of the year, you're losing you know, 52 days, really, of the workforce alongside weekends. But how much of that is actually productive work? Yeah. And what are the benefits that you've done? Well, the staff morale must like... Imagine having enough money and having time to actually do something with it. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's like we work to live. That's the... <laughs> it sucks, man. Yeah. It sucks. And it is the opposite, right? I think four to three, right? Four days work, three days off is kind of like the the healthy balance, right? That's Yeah. And you get paid the same. Paid the same. Hopefully this is a benefit. Hopefully this would lead the way because this has kind of been happening um, ever since COVID. That is like, okay, a lot of people don't want to go back to the office because some uh, companies are realizing that people are a little bit more productive while they're at home because they get to do whatever the fuck they want and do the work, you know, which is quite interesting. I would say it's different for some people, but yeah. Well, it's weird because like, as I said, like in games, of course, you sell the product and then you make the profit, right? That's it. Yeah. So how you get to selling the product, it doesn't really matter as long as the product is done and delivered, right? So yeah. if it's a five-day week or a four-day week or a three-day week, it, as long as the product at the end is the product that sells all, all those copies to make the money for the studio, it doesn't really change anything. It's not like you're asking retail staff to work four days of the week instead of five when you have things to sell that need to be sold to pay people's salaries, right? So you can't just close one day of the week. But, you know, how you finish projects and how you get there doesn't change how much the outcome of the money is, right? So, yeah, no, I think I think it's a really good thing. I hope, uh, hopefully the next game comes out, if I can get like 10 out of 10 and everyone's like, look, you can make a game without crunch and people work this and look, it's great. And then finally we can fucking move on from this shit. <laughs> yeah, someone someone has to lead the charge. <sighs> good job, Idos. Yeah. Like the idea of... Um bottling your energy up over the weekend instead of uh, draining it dry. Yeah. Imagine having a lion on Friday and just not feeling guilty about it because you wasted your weekend. <laughs> you said a lion? Like cocaine? Lion. Like a, like a lion? Like a big oh. cat with a mane? That... Like a lion of cocaine just to keep it going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, it's already fucking Saturday afternoon. Oh. We all heard something different. <laughs> yeah, no, a lion, like... Um, you know, without feeling guilty because you're wasting the only day you have to do anything. Is yeah. that a thing? Like a, a day you sleep in is called a lion? Lie! Oh, I get it. Like lie in. in. Oh, wait, 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 now wait, we, okay. Wait, Americans don't use the word lion? No. Oh. What do you call like staying in bed until like... Sleep in. You call it sleep in? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, kind of. Slept in, you- sleep in. You, you don't call the day you sleep in, more like the morning you slept in. Yeah, slept in. Oh, no, it's lying in the UK. Lie huh. in. I had a lion this morning. Slept in is more like a negative, like, oh no, shit, I slept in. Whereas lion is like, oh, I purposely, instead of waking up at eight, I woke up at 11 or something like that. Like I had, I had a lion. I needed more rest. Yeah, I don't think we have a term that like <laughs> that, that, wow. that has the positive connotation to sleeping in. Yeah, there's no positivity here in the U.S. No, <laughs> you always just slept in. If you're sleeping in, you're you're, you know, you're wasting you're a time. Loser. Yeah, you have nothing going on in your life. <laughs> your job, I don't know. It's all sorts of negativity here. 
about everything. If you're not working eight days a week for 12 hours a day, you're a, a loser, leech, you parasite, hustle. you're a welfare queen, mooching off the system. How dare you work only four days instead of six? In fact, you should be working seven. Oh, yeah. A lot of business owners think that way, my friend. A lot. They, they need to work them to the bone and then replace them over and over and over and over again. But on the way, make sure to schedule them for only 39.5 hours so they don't get full-time benefits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Business, my friend. Gotta spend some money to make some money, and by that I mean human lives. Uh, let's go to listener questions. <laughs> I, I, I hope you guys play Cruelty Squad someday. It's a good depressing time. Anyways, uh, listener questions. We're gonna take a few from both the Patreon and the email inbox, which is findable at Dad and Sons Podcast at gmail.com. You can uh, check the description for the exact spelling for that in case you need help. But first up, we got the ever-regular Chemo Force saying, In our ever-expanding, ever-connected, global, internet-based hellscape, what is it that determines a game's nationality? Is it the country it's developed in, or the nationality of the developers? For example, is the award-winning Curse to Golf a Japanese indie darling because it was made in Japan? Or is it a British indie darling because the developer was originally British? Oh, God. Very good question. I think it depends. Arguably, I think it is where the developer, um, as in not the developer like me, but the studio developer comes from. Let's take, you know, international studios, let's say BioWare or something in America. What if half of their staff are like foreigners, right? Like, you know, what if you got programmers from France or you got artists from Italy and your localizers all live in that country? What determines that that's an international team that made that? But you would say BioWare is an American studio, therefore it's a Western video game. I think the base of operations of where a company comes from and and like the culture of their living that involves them is a part of that. So I would say Costa Golf is from a Kyoto-based studio. So therefore it is a Japanese indie game, I guess. Okay, so what about, uh, since you're so, I, I know you're very versed into, into this uh, subject here. What if Little Ray, what if she wanted to do Japanese porn in the US? What? So there will be no censor bars, right? Is it then mm-hmm. Jap? Is it then Japanese porn, or is it U.S. porn? Oh, you mean Ray Little Black, not Little yeah, Ray. Yeah, the little story. The story they have told us a lot. Right? Yeah, the one, the one who I met that one time. <laughs> met. Physically touched. I did give her a hug. Actually, no, she gave me a hug. That is true. That technically is a true story. I guess this was before COVID. It was. It was. It was. Would I have minded getting COVID? Nah, nah I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> so not the rapper, just being sure, because I'm... No, I... no, but but it's an interesting point, obviously, of a very hilarious subject. But what what is the big, like, American porn company now? Is it Brazzers? Oh, I think so, yeah. If she did it for, like, that, wouldn't it be, like, an American film? Because they're the ones who made it. no. I'm saying if a Japanese company came over here to film. Wait, don't they do that? I think they do do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's Japanese because it's their brand, right? Yeah. So it is it is about the brand. Also, I just realized you said I'm well-versed in this before you <laughs> started the story. And I'm like, oh, hang on a second. Just because I met Rayleigh Black once in a bar doesn't mean anything. You knew anything. who she was. Oh, yeah. Recognized immediately. I No, no, no. Yeah, you I knew. did not. I told you the story. That's not the truth. The Your truth biggest is fan. I was like, I'm pretty sure I know her face. I wonder where I've met her before. But obviously, <laughs> I've not met her. At home with your pants <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> that is false. False information. <laughs> Oh man! Sure it is. Uh, sure it is. Do you guys know the Trash Taste podcast, guys? Oh, I thought no. you were about to say you've been watching a different girl. No, no, no. But uh, <laughs> there, there's a guy who's a part of the Trash Taste podcast. A guy called Connor Dog. 
a C Dog VA. He's a Welsh guy who lives in Japan. He makes great videos. He seems like a genuinely nice guy. Um, but he does make a lot of videos with an ex Japanese porn star. And I always wonder like what his comment sections must be like. Just like those two must be banging. <laughs> like and obviously that yeah. just people associate porn stars as like having sex with everybody. Did so, anyone else get here from their Pornhub recommendations? <laughs> Even me, like, I used to think, like, okay, porn star automatically, like, whoa, like, that's your life. Like, that's you. You, like, listen to people like Sasha Gray, like, on Twitch and stuff, and you're just like, these are just regular, f- this is normal fucking people. Oh, yeah. They're totally normal people. <laughs> Sometimes they need surgery money, too. I mean, Ray, Ray was saying that she was, she was going to university. Like, she quit, and she was going to university or something, and she was studying law, so... I mean, sometimes I we all need college money really, really bad. Okay. I mean, in Japan, that is a thing. No, I just think that what some people hold as sex being sacred is not the same for everybody. Oh, sex isn't sacred. You know, what I'm saying like showing it's your fun. body and stuff like that. The OnlyFans people and all that, and there's like guys too. It's not only women that do OnlyFans. Um, there's like couples, full on couples that do this stuff. Like, listen. Like, they making money. <laughs> they making money. And if they feel comfortable sharing their life, like some, you know, horny, mostly dudes, horny dudes, you know, like, shit. Maybe if you have, like, the problem with it, maybe it's just, like, you're just not as accepting. The question at the core of the dilemma here is one, a, a ship of Theseus style issue of transitive properties. If the porn is made outside of Japan, but still made by Japanese people, does it count as Japanese porn? I'll say so it does. So if an American porn company goes to Japan, though, and makes regular, ordinary American porn, but it's sold for the Japanese market, which means they have to put the blurries over everyone's uglies. It's Japanese porn. But the blurriness and, and the Japanese text on the, the box and some subtitles would turn... Because if you watch a, a, a foreign movie in America, you know it's a foreign movie. So I assume if they watch foreign porn in Japan, they can tell it's foreign porn. <laughs> Yeah, because there's no fucking censor bars. Yeah, we're going. We're this was only just a this derail. This was you. You started this. This is only you just to derail, derail like the whole British and Japanese uh, studio company. It's really similar to another really annoying question, and that is if it's a Western animation but drawn in the style of Japanese anime. And, you know, you're sitting around the bar with some friends. Are you going to call it anime? Is Blood of Zeus an anime? Is Castlevania Netflix uh, an anime? If uh, if they were really made by Korean or Chinese or American animators. I, I say all this to say I don't think it matters, right? Like, I don't think Liam has to have a label of a British game or a Japanese game. It's just a fucking game. Yeah. Well, I have a scenario for you. Mm -hmm. And that is when it comes to like criticism and and cultural categorization and in historical research, like a weird transient property, I would say, is the Metroid Prime games. They're made in Texas, but the brand, the company, the publisher, actually, this is a similar situation with Metroid Dread, right? But uh, the brand and and the, the, the publisher are totally Japanese. It comes from a long line of mostly Japanese games rather than Western games, but it totally rides that line. Well, so like Nintendo Dread, that literally just came out. That's a Nintendo game that's made by a Spanish developer. Spanish. Yeah. So like when you're writing a review of that game, you 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 would want to clarify, but when doing like cultural historical research a century later about relations between East and Western companies and how that manifested into pop culture trends of the two, you would totally, like, it would matter in that case. Like, when when looking at uh, what sort of influences go into, like, like Zelda, right? It's um, got Arthurian Western influences, but the core assumptions underneath it are, like, more Buddhist. It's about uh, uh, helping the kingdom be in harmony with its environment. And, and cleaning up the, the pollution that Ganon is spreading through the environment, even though it's using Western iconography of swords and stones and, 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 and giant stone cathedrals. I think that's just the devs influencing their, their product, right? Like, but that influence 
comes from their culture and their nationality. Yeah, but there's also plenty of uh, studios that have like, just a mix of people. They're not all just one. So like if there was a mix of people in Japan and they ended up creating something like... For example, let's take um, Evil Within 2, right? So we know Evil Within. Yeah. It's called, yeah, it's it, called Psycho Break in Japan, right? It happens a lot. So that's a that's Tango Gameworks, a Japanese studio. You'd say that's a Japanese game, Shinji Mikami Studio. But the director is John Jonas, who is an American. Even though he speaks fluent Japanese and, of course, directs a Japanese team for the most part, still has foreigners on the team. He is the director and, it, you know, he's American. And the, the publisher is Bethesda. So that's, ah. that's where a lot of that comes from. And, and Enter the Gungeon was also made by an expat team in, of Westerners in Japan, right? Dodge Roll? Are they in Japan? I'm looking it up. My memory tells me, tells me so. I do think, um, for simplicity, I think it's where the studio is based. I just think that is the case. Mm. I don't think it's important. We do have this philosophy of a Western game versus like a Japanese game or like JRPGs and stuff, but that's like a that's a way the game is crafted, right? JRPGs are crafted in a specific yeah. certain way, but you could argue, Generic. for example, like well, um, <laughs> what's a game that you really liked, Matt? Crosscode, mm -hmm. you know, uh, games like that, and also what the the guys who made the uh, the summoner, the mess the messenger. You know, the guys who are making the Messenger, their new game is like a JRPG that's inspired by Chrono Trigger, right? It's like a, it's more like a craft than anything else, right? Yeah. Um, so I do think for simplicity, we say where the studio is from. So I would say, yeah, Coast to Golf is a game that comes from a Kyoto based studio with a philosophy kind of inspired by where it's made. So yeah, I think it's a good question, to be honest. It applies to a lot of things. Like, is Dune a big holiday uh, Hollywood movie, but it's made by Denis Villeneuve? Questions, questions, though. Like, what are the inspirations that went into Curse to Golf? Like, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but golf is not super duper popular in Japan, isn't it? Like, they have driving ranges, but... Golf is really popular in Japan. It's just only played by the rich. <laughs> oh, really? Is it expensive there to play oh, golf? It's, it's like what you imagine golf was in the 80s and 90s in America what? and Europe. It's like... It's not as accessible as it is in the West, for sure. Yeah, really? I don't remember seeing any. Like, I remember seeing driving ranges, but like the baseball cages, but not an actual real golf course whenever. Well, yeah, of course. Like in cities, right? Like Tokyo, there's no space really. So it's prime real estate to own that much space in Tokyo and build a golf course. It's not real. So they're usually on the outskirts. Kyoto has about five or six. So, you know, but there's a lot more grassland and stuff here. So... Yeah, I don't know. But in terms of the inspirations for golf, or Coast to Golf, I mean, my design philosophy, I think if anybody asks, is very heavily inspired by simplistic, you know, mechanics in Nintendo games, right? Like, that is a heavy inspiration alongside indie games too. But I think there's something in Japanese games called Merry Harry. It's like the Merry Harry nature of games, which means the up and down tonality of like the player's highs versus, you know, the come down of that kind of thing. And that, that seems like a very Kyoto-based philosophy and it comes very much from like Miyamoto and Nintendo, and it's carried through to a lot of the studios here. So I think there is some aspects that you could say are definitely inspired by the culture of Kyoto. So it's it's interesting to think about for sure. That actually is exactly what I was trying to dig up. Mary is can can you say that term again? I want to Google Mary it. Harry. I want to read all about it. M A R I. Yeah, Heidi H A R I. Here we go. Awesome. Hell yeah. There, there it is. That's probably where the, the crossover between the zeitgeist of Japanese culture and Curse to Golf bleed into one another. Yeah, for sure. Of course, right? You know, ever since I made Suzuki Salaryman, right? Salaryman Suzuki, I can't even name my own game, right? A lot of my games or the way I design things are, of course, inspired by my experiences playing Nintendo games, but also the fact that I live in Japan, right? There's a, there's a kind of nature that fits into that based on me being here so oh, fuck when i google this the the mata Hari game comes up instead but anyways yeah i want to i want to research into that later on with some links and a better string of text to plug in but yeah no that that actually is really interesting that they like have a word for for simplistic mechanics in video games well it's more of like the feeling the player goes through when playing your game right miyamoto always talks about the fact that you play mario and you run through a level and then you'd have the flag moment You'd have the transitional period. 
of the come down of your achievement into the map. And then, you know, if you're playing Super Mario World, for example, the dun 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 like the slowdown. Of everything. The roller coaster of emotion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is kind of described as like a roller coaster of emotions, right? So. Merry Harry. Is, yeah. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, Paul C. Uh, says, I heard George mention Adam Sessler in one of the podcasts and had a flood of memories from G4's heyday. Good memories of watching X-Play reruns while waiting for new episodes to air during the 5th gen to 6th gen transition and eagerly anticipating summertime E3 coverage. Do you guys have any fond memories of games media before the YouTube-driven game media of today? Yes. Uh, I think I mentioned One Up Show last time. Uh, and I think that was all part of like the same ecosystem of media. I used to watch it on my iPod Nano. Uh, X Play, G Four, all that stuff, man. I, I watched everything. Um, I enjoyed that stuff. One Up had a really good site with really good editorials that went offline, and a lot of them were about these subtle cultural quirks between uh, uh, Japanese and Western game design. It does go to show that most of the One Up crew, or and you know, prior to that, the EGM crew, all went on to work in the actual industry. Like those guys knew their fucking shit. They they knew it. Oh, uh, game, game trailers. trailers. Yeah, yeah, we said it at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Go. Game trailers. Gotta love those Hands reviews, down. man. Those reviews were perfect for me back then when I was younger. It was just like, they just hit the spot. Yeah. They had some great shows. Shane Satterfield, whatever his name was. You know, of course, the Easy Ally guys still exist, but yeah. uh, game trailers was a, was a thing. GameSpot, way back before when they had the on the spot show. Yeah. That was great, too. Really enjoyed that. I remember Danny O'Dwyer doing the point before. Yeah, this was this was even like five years before that, uh, maybe even longer. Like on the spot was like 2005, 2006, maybe. But like, like, like really childhood George was spending way too much time reading game magazines. That's what I wanted to do when I grew up was work at a game magazine. Did you guys ever get a hold of one of the game in Farcer copies they would do for their their April Fools issue? It's pretty amazing. They uh, would have a a parody issue called Game in Farcer, and I thought it was just the most the hilarious thing when I was like eleven years old. They they would have like novelty parody reviews of Pokemon Plaid Edition, and it was uh. It, it, uh, I was mentioning to, to Liam earlier about Edge Magazine and how when something's on paper, it makes it feel more official and authoritative and smarter than when you see it on a screen. Yeah, I, I've got to admit, like, yeah, so if anybody doesn't know, Curse to Golf has a huge two-page preview in this month's Edge Magazine, which for me is like a boyhood dream complete because there were like three there was loads of video game mags in the UK back in the day. And of course, you guys had Game Informer and, and Nintendo Power and stuff like that. But for us, it was like Edge, Games TM, rest in peace, which was hands down the best magazine, Games Master. And then you had official Nintendo magazine, official PlayStation magazine, official Xbox magazine. But out of those, official Nintendo magazine was like an industry. But Games TM and Edge were the top two. And the fact that you know, I'd always wanted to work for Edge or, or Games TM. You know, that would have been amazing. But the the idea that now there's a preview of a game I'm working on in Edge is like, oh. <gasps> but it is that kind of legitimacy that it's on paper. It, it you know, it's like in a, it's like being in a newspaper. There's just something kind of weirdly special versus just having internet articles written about. It carries prestige, and I honestly wonder if a lot of those old video game magazines would hold up nowadays compared to like higher quality internet reporting that exists nowadays. But in either case, there was still more of an industry around those magazines. Like you would have a design department of people working on publishing software to put together the visuals and the graphics alongside the department of people actually writing the story, alongside another department of people selling ads for the thing, alongside a whole nother company that would be doing the printing and distribution and actually mailing it out to customers. And all of those jobs, uh, the, the more and more magazines go away and the more and more media transitions to online, you have less jobs required to make the product at the end of the cycle. And that's 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 one thing that especially like I did not foresee being a 
byproduct of the transition from from on print media to online as a mm. child who wanted to do this when I was growing up. Ah. Yeah, there's definitely some weird legitimacy to it. I mean, th- once you put something to paper and print, right, that's kind of immovable. Um, so maybe there is some more. It's going to be in a landfill for centuries. Yeah. I it's not that necessarily I think things are bad now, but but yeah, there was a there was a nice nostalgia to game trailers, even like the E3s of old and the coverage around E3s at the time. Yeah, G4 would have uh, like 24-7 days blocks of it during E3 season. And, you know, E3 has always been a pretty big deal, but the past two years definitely have seen that that part of the industry transitioning over into something else. Yeah, any Any other weird memories of electronic toys monthly magazine <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm trying to think early days of youtube as well but no even that wasn't that good to be honest uh jacob wants to know what video game trailer song is your favorite and slash or has stuck with you the most Woodkid iron from the uh, assassin's creed brotherhood trailer Sins of the Father from the Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain E3 2013 Ooh. trailer. Yeah, that was a good one. Also, Goliath from Woodkid, again, in the new Death Stranding Director's Cut trailer. Jesus, you guys know the fucking names. Gross. Get good. Nerds. No, no, it's it's fucking because their trailer is sold on their music, <laughs> right? It's like music that's not in the game. It's music that is like paid for to be in the trailer, right? I, I, I would say the first thing that always comes to mind is Mad World. Uh, I knew you were going to say that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still listen to it every once in a while. Uh, from uh, Gears Fly of War. Fly Me to the Moon, trailer. Bayonetta. Mm, right. Definitely Woodkid, Iron. That was a great. Great, great trailer and great track. I'm I'm the bomb and I'm gonna blow up from Dead Island too. Oh, uh, was the Fallout one that I don't want to set the world? Oh yes, I, uh, ink, ink, the spots. ink spots, yeah. ink spots, the ink spots. I don't want to set the world on fire. Yeah, yes, that's definitely I one too. I just want to start. Li- <laughs> that's on my playlist. A flame too. in your heart. <laughs> so good. Do you guys remember the 1999 Smash Brothers commercial with the big mascots and like puffy yes. costumes fighting each other? And in the background, there so was like... So happy together? Yeah, yeah. happy together. Yeah. yeah, of course. Da, 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 Oh, um, um, uh, but, 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 I don't know which GTA. It might have been 3 or it might have been San Andreas. The Welcome to the Jungle! The jungle. Guns oh, we Rises. got fun and games! Fun and games. <laughs> We got everything you want. Just know the name. Yeah, that was a great trailer too. Yeah, there's Um, there's been a few good ones. Trying to think of any other outstanding ones. I bet there's some Sonic one that has like the most butt metal of butt metal on it. Gangster's Paradise. (laughs) (laughs) I would rewatch the Sonic movie if they released the rat cut. I would totally like go down for another run. Yeah, man, I, uh, I, I, I can't wait for the for knuckles, man. Can't wait. <laughs> Idris Alba's knuckles. Fuck yeah! <laughs> it's gonna be a mess, and I'm gonna love it. I love these video game movies that have been coming out. I know some people have like they don't like it, but I, I, I I've been having. Oh good my fun. god! Have you guys seen the trailer for the new Resident Evil movie? No. They are rebooting the Resident Evil cinematic Resident Evil verse so that everyone's costumes and monster designs are going to look more like a weird old Japanese video game trying to depict a Western setting from 1997. Um, Yeah, like uh, Jill and and Leon are are wearing their doofy Resident Evil 2 outfits. But in the background, they use a like grisly horror remix of that... um, he man, and so I take a deep breath and I step outside. outside and I take a deep breath and step outside and say, ah, What's going on? That's not how the actual song goes, but you guys know the song I'm talking about, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I forget it's who made so it. It's so stupid. This trailer is so stupid. It looks good. It looks fun. It looks dumb. They used I'm a, watching it now. A, a, Why does Leon got black hair? Already big fail. I, 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 if you have the volume on, you'll hear an extremely weird choice of song, which is how it relates to the question that Jacob was asking for the listener question Why segment of the podcast. Why are using this guy, dude? No. 
No. Don't Do, wait, wait, what what guy. what what guy? I don't like that guy. What's his name? What is Oh fuck, what is his name? Which one I, is is he a bad guy? <laughs> no, he's one of the main guys. He's there. He's he's with with the girl. Fucking hell. Hold on, I'll find him. I hate this guy's <laughs> I just don't there's certain you know there's certain types of generic looking white guys that you just don't want. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to see in a movie. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like Nolan North. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Nolan North. Is it Robbie? But yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, I feel so weirdly pandered to by this thing because you can tell that they're trying to like remake cutscene scenes from the video game. But with like big expensive Hollywood production values with the brown filter all over the screen. And and it feels so weird seeing costumes that look that stupid in live action being given that much like attention from the crew. Like like uh Leon's police uniform is Spawn. It does not look as cool in real life as it does in a 3D video game, but they really tried. They really went for it. Yeah, but it's spot on. <laughs> That's the weird thing about video game costumes, right? Like if you were to make a live action version of like Devil May Cry and have Dante in his big red coat, he would look fucking stupid, right? Because he has his little nips poking out. <laughs> yeah, like video game costumes do not translate to real world cosplay very well, <laughs> very often. It looks stupid. It takes a very, very skilled set of... of, of uh, of, of talents and, and very, very specific lighting and angles and situations to nail the look. There's so much like anger and controversy whenever they change the costume designs, but that's the problem right there is that if they didn't change it, it would look not great and or fall apart all the time on set. I know why I don't like this guy. This guy's the brother of Arrow. Oh, he does look like him. From the CW. He has the same face. I have watched him before in Ark and Upload. Uh, upload is like some sci-fi shit. He's okay. It's just his face. I just don't like Arrow. Arrow's he's so ah. Even if they're wearing the dumb video game costumes, it's off the table for you because of that guy. No, I'm gonna no. I'm fucking watching this shit. I'm fucking watching this shit. I just I just, uh. You know when you you know when they like for instance the boys, the guy who plays uh uh Homelander. You know. Oh, he's like that's great. how you that's that's how you cast a white guy right there, man. Yeah, like, he's, he's great. He's great, man. As he's I, the, and he's the type of actor that when you see him in something else, you you can't not see Homelander, which you know means it was cast very uh, well. His his the way he has his his jawline and his mouth rip like turns like it's just they just he just does a fucking good job. Like I when I see this dude. Right, it has nothing to do with him being a generic white guy. It's just him as an actor, like he just looks the same in every fucking thing. He's not doing anything different. Like change his hair, like shave his eyebrows with something. I don't know, like do something. Don't look generic, action man. Uh, yeah, action man. That's what I should be saying. Action man. Generic it's just like, action it's just, man. It's just that every fucking movie is just a white guy. You know, fighting like that's. I I think I'm too colorblind to see the difference. Okay, yeah, okay. Oh Bullshit. yes, yes. Bullshit. And I, I gotta say though, um, you look like you're about to pee. But I gotta say though, like, <laughs> I I've been I watching a lot of media, gotta, and gotta, man, gotta there's a lot there. of diversity now. Like nice. there's a lot of yeah. <laughs> no, don't say nice. You haven't seen it. No, none of you guys have seen it. Seen what? Media? Like, like foundation. <laughs> like foundation. Like Oh, it's you didn't like, say that. You said media. Yeah, media. Like like just shows and, and movies. Yeah, but, like, yeah, but, but, you, but you didn't say foundation specifically. No, until, like, like no, I'm I'm naming a few that I've been watching. Oh, I saw I saw the first two episodes. Yeah, it's it's like I thought it was very boring. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very interesting it's a very but interesting editing show. uh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't even tell what the fuck was happening in the first episode. I was like, wait, what? All right. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, goes back and forth. So this is actually a very relevant and pertinent question because it's all about how to cast generic, boring white people mm -hmm. and also mad. 
Uh, Mr. Boobles wants to ask, Dad and Sons, who would you cast as yourself in the new Mario movie? As in, if we were to play a character, which character would we play? Toad. You would be Toad? I'd be Toad. I'd want to be Toad. You would want to be Toad. You wouldn't just have it forced upon you. Yeah, but I would like, I wouldn't do what you'd expect. Because I I do expect Toad, like, sitting on the sidelines, just giving instructions. No, no, I'd just just be like, hello there, Mario. (laughs) It is I, your old friend Toad, huh? Russian grandpa. Yeah, we go back to war together, huh? You remember those days I still have PTSD about the time Bowser took you away from me, huh? It does fit better than I thought when I visualize with my mind's eye. You can imagine like kind of an old, you know, you know, Grandpa Toad from Mario Sunshine. That's the way he would talk. Yeah, and it does like actually fit the face and the mouth when I picture it. He, he is kind you and of, Luigi fucking about again, huh? He's kind of portly. You can imagine him, like, giggling with a, a belly slap going on. Oh, 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 oh. oh I, I guess you I would... You me as told, huh? I, I would be Boo. You just don't you talk. You look like Mario, though. But I wouldn't want to steal the show, you know? I wouldn't want to steal Chris Pratt's spotlight. Too much pressure. I just want to, you know, be shy, but uh, come out of my shell every once in a while. Just, just, but kind of float around in the background generally. I think, man, I don't even know. Like, I, I feel like, I feel like I would probably would want to try like uh, the guy who the the guy who's in the cloud, who always grabs Mario with the the fishing. Yeah, Lakitu. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll try to be like that guy. <laughs> I can imagine that. You, you kind of yeah. look like him too, right? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Like, the, the I'll just glasses. be out there, like, all right, flying Nimbus, and like, and, and just fucking <laughs> help out. I don't know. That would be cool. I don't know. I all the other characters. Uh, I don't know if I really identify with. Them. <laughs> I don't want to be Yoshi's cool, but I don't want to be thrown off. You know, I don't want to die because Mario wants to like get to the. You could be like a grizzled one who's trying to take revenge on him. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The evil Yoshi. Like, oh like my god. Yoshi's man. father t- coming to avenge his. You know son. how like Scrappy Doo took revenge on Scooby Doo in the Scooby Doo movie. Oh, the shit. live action one. Oh, really? What? Are you yeah. are you shitting me? No, have you never seen the live action Scooby Doo movie with like Matthew Lillard no. and Buffy in it? And Wait, should Freddy I? Mist, Jr.? Is that what we should do for the podcast Scra- next week? Scrappy, Scrappy Doo is the bad guy. Are we all gonna watch Scooby Doo and come back for a class discussion? <laughs> <laughs> like Scooby and Shaggy get high and shit. It's great. Really? Yeah. Holy shit! They just oh, they're, they're oh like breaking God, down man. all the barriers. But it's like. It's like them getting high, but it's like them just eating or something. I can't remember what is the uh, the safe way. So it's like like all the dirty jokes the adults were thinking of when watching Scooby Doo. They went and did it. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Scrappy Doo getting revenge and Shaggy and Scooby getting high. That's yeah. That that tracks. I twenty thirty years in every childhood cartoon becomes a postmodern cynical inside joke for the adults who grew up watching them, don't they? I feel proud of the fact that the three of us didn't take any of the top spots. You know, we knew our place. We all picked side <laughs> characters: Toad, <laughs> Boo, and uh, Lakitu. I can't. That's such a weird name for that guy. I would not imagine that guy's named Lakitu, but. If any of the main characters, I'll probably shoot for like Bowser or some shit like that. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to be a main character. I just don't want to be in the spotlight. I just want to run the spotlight. I want to. I want to be the one pointing the spotlight at whoever is stealing it. <laughs> you know how the curtains uh, come in and out in Mario Brothers Three. I want to be the guy who's operating the curtains in the menus of Mario Brothers <laughs> Three. George has been standing up for the last ten minutes. I I do have to poo. I oh wow, it's not even just the number one, huh? I just I think that <laughs> I think that ends that episode. <laughs> I I that is why I'm standing up. If thanks for asking, I'm happy to let you know. Are you prairie prairie dogging right now? <laughs> oh gee, like, come on! I guys, don't know what that means. <laughs> Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs>